we're just waiting uh, one or two minutes before we begin, and then we will start. We're very excited that everyone has joined from across the globe, mm. uh, from uh, from the United States all the way to Sing to Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> So almost all time zones. Mm. Truly global. Yes, yeah. And that's what's so fantastic about Catalyst 2030. Yeah. It's a true platform network for everybody to join and be part and express themselves and to learn and, and to share. Yeah, we're getting people. People are coming in. <laughs> I think good, they're good. jumping also off other sessions and then uh, coming into this session. Ah, Su Susanna, you're Bram. <laughs> Sorry, renaming myself in a second. <laughs> I've made you co-host, Susanna. Uh, Susanna, uh, not Sue, Susanna. I will rename myself as Sue, Rana. That might be easier. Yeah, that way I don't get confused <laughs> between you. And welcome, Rofran. It's nice to see you in many of the sessions. Uh, Wafa as well. Absolutely. I'm so happy to join the photo. I'm so happy that, that these sessions are happening, actually. All right. Do you want to start, Ziad? Or, or okay. 7.05? We'll wait one minute and then begin okay. at 05. Thank you, Rana, for uh, the shout out. <laughs> Thank you. And um, great work, Catalyst. Oh, great. We're having people from India uh, and uh, all across. Hello, Arshita. And if not a member, if you're not a member of Catalyst, we urge you to become a member. Uh, please follow the sessions. Uh, there's fantastic sessions going on all over, you know, <laughs> all across the time zones. So please join and, and tell us what you think. And maybe next year you will be uh, you'll be part of Catalyst and you'll be hosting your own sessions to share and discuss what topics you're interested in and you want the world to to. Um, to discuss with the world as well. We have Debbie. Hello, Debbie. Hey, ladies. Hi. <laughs> nice having you with us. Can't wait for your session on Thursday. We're having a live session at the Hashemite University, Catherine, on Thursday. Yeah. All right. I think we should start, Ziad. Let's begin. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in the second day of Catalyzing Change Week. Uh, and this session is about how to conduct research on program impact under humanitarian conditions. Unfortunately, humanitarian condition has been uh, very central in our lives all across the globe and is not confined to one region of the world or the other, which kind of reminds us of our shared humanity. And we've got a fantastic um, panel that we're, I'm very excited to uh, introduce, but let's kick it off with our Catalyst video. Uh, Ziad, over to you. Catalyst 2030 is the movement of social entrepreneurs and innovators embracing collective action to achieve the SDGs by the deadline 2030. 
Our 1,500 members are active in 197 countries. By emphasizing collaborations, Catalyst 2030 is leveraging the power of the collective to accelerate real change in the lives of billions of people around the globe. What do our members say about Catalyst? Catalyst 2030 is an invaluable global community of impact entrepreneurs. Our relationship with Catalyst 2030 has really taught us the power of co-creation. Join Catalyst 2030 and network bond and collaborate with our family members. And I like the spirit of bringing change makers together to share and learn from each other. Catalyst really understands the transformative nature of um, collaboration. It's also a platform that uh, can give us um, new tools and resources. Catalyst 2030 has put my work on steroids. But most importantly, to come up with solutions that are practical, ways where we can really make things happen, because social entrepreneurs are doers. Are you a catalyst? Join us to achieve the SDGs. Figured it stopped on you, Rana. <laughs> they, welcome, everyone. It's so nice to have everybody here with us. We're very excited to kick off this panel uh, and, and to learn from each other and to share information. Uh, because that's the only way we can grow. And that's what Catalyst is all about. It's about co-creation, collaboration, and communication. So this, this panel is actually, or this, this uh, session is about discussing what are the um, challenges uh, going forward to allow us to conduct good scientific research on uh, the impact of interventions uh, under humanitarian conditions. But it's not just about talking about the challenges. We wanna talk about the solutions. We wanna talk about the best practices. And this, and this is coming from a panel of experts from across the globe who actually work under different conditions and have been able to figure out what are those tips and, and things that we can do while challenging uh, the system as it is uh, and encouraging paradigm shifts and systems change so that we, could do, we can do better programming all in the goal of achieving sustainable development goals, hopefully before 2094 as projected uh, after COVID-19 and all the delays that haven't happened. But first, before we delve into the, uh, uh, the panel, I wanna introduce my fantastic panelists. And I'll start with Professor Catherine Panterbrick. Uh, Catherine Panterbrick is the Bruce A. and Debbie L. Ellen Chabner Professor of Anthropology, Health and Global Affairs at Yale University. She's a medical anthropologist trained in human biology and the social sciences, which is a rare combination, which is fantastic because that's when you know, when you cross boundaries, that's where innovation happens. Uh, she holds appointments in the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, the Department of Anthropology and the School of Public Health at Yale University. Uh, Catherine is an expert on risk and resilience, having spent three decades working with people affected by violence, poverty, and marginalization. Her work with Syrian refugee youth is an example of scientific research, evaluating the extent to which interventions can alleviate stress, boost resilience, and improve lives in more affected communities. She has integrated methods from ethnography, cross-cultural psychiatry, child development, and stress biology to learn about the impact of violence on youth, mental health in Jordan, Afghanistan, and Nepal. And I can go on and on talking about Catherine, but I'm sure her, uh, her experience will, will show through uh, her shared um, participation in this panel. Next, I would like to introduce with, uh, with us Dr. Uh, Susanna Chu. Uh, she goes by Sue. So Sue's publications cover research areas in leadership and identity, social entrepreneurship, and social impact measurement. Her teaching encompasses leadership, uh, social entrepreneurship, sustainability, corporate social responsibility, business ethics, and organizational behavior. Uh, Sue is an ass assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong, and uh, she is also an active member uh, of Catalyst 2030 to take it beyond and, and in, to in, in, include research and everything that Catalyst does with her fantastic people skills as she goes forward. Next, we have Professor Heather Flo, who I hope has joined us. And if not, uh, she will in a couple of minutes. She's on a train in London, uh, but I'll introduce her briefly just to save time. So Heather is a professor uh, uh, at the School of Psychology at the University of Birmingham. 
she has developed memory enhancing broad reach, low cost procedures that enable witnesses and victims to achieve their best evidence in criminal proceedings, particularly in the areas of sexual violence and criminal identification. She works with uh, survivor organizations, legal practitioners, and governments to develop better uh, best practices guidelines for documenting and investigating incidents. Uh, and together, uh, her and I, she leads the Rights for Time Research Network, which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, Global Challenges Research Fund in the UK, and uh, which commissions community-led research on humanitarian protection in the Global South, uh, as well as other projects. So hopefully she'll be joining us soon uh, and uh, we will be also listening to her and learning from her. Lastly, I'll just briefly introduce myself for those who don't know me. Uh, I'm uh, uh, a professor of molecular biology uh, and uh, I work on genetics of ethnic populations and epigenetics of trauma along with Catherine and Heather and Sue. And we study the impact of interventions not only from a self-reporting perspective but using biomarkers looking as Catherine says, under the skin. I'm also the founder of We Love Reading, an organization that works on changing mindsets through reading to create change makers. And I'm a proud mem uh, member of Catalyst and head of the MENA chapter and the Jordan chapter. So we welcome you all to this fantastic uh, panel that I'm going to uh, kick off by uh, addressing a question, uh, starting with Catherine, uh, about uh, why, uh, uh, actually, I'm gonna start with Sue, if you don't mind, Catherine why evidence-based research is important for achieving the sustainable development goals. And, and Lou, we're look, Sue, we're looking for you to share with us a concrete example. You know, at uh, Catalyst, we're all about doing. So yes, we, we need the theory and we need the abstract, but we need the practical hands-on. So over to you, Sue. Thank you, Rana. And uh, thank you for the introduction. I do impact research for social projects and um, together with social entrepreneurs, mostly related to human development, for example, capacity building of staff teams or personal development of low motivation students. So as a result, the reason why um, I see that it is important to um, advance SDG through research is because through research, we could learn more about the beneficiaries' needs or pain points, well, um, Rana who warned me not to use beneficiary as a term, but I don't like to use sample here within this context of Catalyst 2030. And at the same time, if we um, do systemic, systematic research as well as scientific research, we could also look at um, causal relations to see whether the interventions actually could impact the samples or beneficiaries. And as a result, we could look at impact so with human development, we're talking about the improvement of self-confidence or self-advocacy, or even um, in my area, motivation to lead or lead identity. And over time with the cumulative um, impact creation, we could see whether systemic change could be made. And that's how we um, look at whether um, SDG goals could be um, pursued and um, pursued effectively and efficiently. And Rana has asked me to um, give an example. Um, I've just finished um, a research for um, social enterprise um, that promotes inclusive workplace. A very quick background of the story, um, they actually raise up um, visually impaired as well as hearing impaired um, staff for doing dark or silent workshops. Over COVID in 2020, because of um, the um, social distancing and restriction, um, over 200 days of um, the um, business actually closed. So they have to um, actually change the offerings and look for funding. And that um, they were lucky enough to um, get a funder to fund the capacity building. Basically, the whole staff team have to be um, reinventing themselves and then um, do um, a lot of skills enhancement and all that in that process is an intervention that actually um, improve knowledge, improve skill set, and not only about the um, visually impaired or the hearing impaired, but the whole staff team is a capacity building exercise and human development. So um, that is a very um, important um, research from my point of view, not 
for academic research, but showing how the interventions through the funding actually improve the um, capacity, but also um, leading to inclusive workplace being developed in a sense that um, the staff teams could be uh, much more resilient and they could actually serve other communities like the elderly as well. So um, this is, from my point of view, very small, but maybe incremental steps they could continue through the funding. And that is um, the kind of research I do uh, with social projects as well as social organizations. Okay, so um, I think um, that is a sample of um, what I've done um, in the field and from my point of view is actually very cool and uh, um, project that I've just done um, could be um, kind of under SDG 8. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for kind of giving us the broad umbrella about why research is important and giving us that concrete example. But we want we're here to ask the difficult questions and to have those difficult conversations. So Catherine, over to you. Uh, you're an expert in, in, in doing research under humanitarian conditions. And so what are the challenges that you have faced and, and, and how have you dealt with them? And what are those best practices or solutions? And, and what has really made you stay up at night of doing this research to impact uh, the people? Well, Rana, there's a lot of questions rolled into one. So <laughs> let me start with the first one. Uh, you know, um, as an anthropologist, we, we kind of like um, the, the cultural side of us, because I do medical anthropology, so I look at the body and mind as well. But the social point of view is like looking at what kind of glasses you've got when you're wearing glasses and your worldview on things. And so I would say, for first of all, <clears throat> and the challenge in humanitarian conditions is that we have a pair of glasses that makes us work for people in need, right? We are paternalistic in our approach to people in need. We intervene, we come, we save them from crises, and that's what we do. We don't have the worldview glasses that help us necessarily build resilience, build agency, build entrepreneurship, and that's com a complete different mindset of things. So we're in the process of changing from, you know, the paternalistic view of glasses to the um, par partnership view of glasses, for instance. And one telling <clears throat> thing is, for instance, the word collaboration. The word collaboration that you've been using could be simply uh, me collaborating with you and doing my own thing, you doing your own thing, and we do working for people, or it could be true engagement. And so um, that matters, you know. So I would say one of the biggest challenge is actually the um, mindset that you approach the problem with. If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you are you are um, a crisis humanitarian, you rescue people from crisis. If you are a resilient building humanitarian, you try and let lives flourish in the long term. And the biggest problem I think is funding because funders are slightly lagging behind the uh, empirical evidence that we give about people's capacities and they still fund projects for people. They don't fund projects to work with people. Um, and I think that's probably a, a big, big uh, kind of like background view that influences the constraints that we have in the world, in the, in the work. So if I, if I want to challenge, uh, you know, try to dig deeper into what you just said, and you talked about, you know, how, how funders and sometimes scientists or, uh, you know, people behind the uh, setting up the goals for, for doing research under such conditions have a particular frame, frame of mind. And you're talking about changing that mindset. And I remember you, you talked to me about uh, structural uh, uh, versus uh, like equity versus effectiveness of programs. So could you elaborate more on that and, and, and share sure. with us your experience? Uh, because I, I wanna highlight what's different. We all talk about research and under humanitarian, and I want to I want to hear I want to hear to challenge, and for people to go out uh, away from this session with their mindsets uh, changed, and having the terminology and the examples from your work uh, to 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 change how work is done. So so for for example, if you know I I am building a project uh, somewhere with with some people somewhere in the world etc. And I'm a very project based person, and so very often my dimension of of the success of that pro project is how effective it is. 
And so the lens, the glasses I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the project is everything through the lens of the effectiveness. <clears throat> Who's on board, what's gonna happen and what the things I need to put that. But a totally different kind of lens would be the structural lens that you mentioned, which would be on equity, meaning fairness, meaning do I widen inequalities in the community that I'm working with by getting the people who are ready to change to change and adopt what I'm doing and leaving everybody behind? Or do I have <clears throat> less of an utilitarian effectiveness kind of mindset to look at fairness and um, engagement and that kind of thing? And so, so these are, you know, what, what do I work for as a social entrepreneur? Do I work for effectiveness? Do I work for social justice? Do I work for partnerships? Do I work for communities? Do I work for leadership? All these different kind of things are like, I think, um, eyeglasses. And the point that I'm trying to make actually is that we all need our different eyeglasses. We just don't want to be blind to each other. And so it's very nice to work with teams where we see slightly different things. So when Sue might look at, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and business kind of ideas, I might look at, you know, whether this is helping the most vulnerable or not. And so we all have these different kinds of glasses. And the beauty in research is actually to do, to do it together you know, to, to find different ways of working together because then we understand the world in a, in a, better, in a better way. Thank you. Thank you for, for talking about the beauty of collaboration, the beauty of working together. How do we celebrate our diversity while working together towards a particular goal to make uh, li life better, but keeping in mind, as you said, uh, uh, respecting, trusting, and I always use that word and we have a discussion about which we'll come back to, uh, the, the people on the ground and what they need. Over to you, Heather. Welcome. We're glad that you were able to make it. So Heather, we introduced you earlier. Uh, Heather is our third panelist and we're very happy that you were able to join us. So Heather, the question to you, uh, you're ahead of a, a network project uh, that we both work on. And, and Catherine was just talking about working across cultures, across disciplines the importance of, of building those partnerships. So would you uh, uh, share with us, uh, Heather, uh, the importance of networks in doing better research and better science for the betterment of humanity? Thank you, Rana. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for holding this event. Um, I think we're, we're really fortunate with the Rights for Time Research Network, which draws together partners from five countries so far and counting. And the partners are really the bedrock of the project. They're at the heart of everything that we do as a network. It's a, a network that is comprised of academics as well as of partners, CSO, NGO partners, um, such as We Love Reading and, and many others uh, concentrated in the global south. And what we work on is studying humanitarian grassroots initiatives around protection and what's really critical is that rather than taking a top-down approach to humanitarian protection like many international organizations tend to do, or dare I say, typically always do, um, we instead approach it bottom up. And for us, the biggest achievement will be to have impacts uh, that affect directly the lives of people in communities. And the way to, to achieve that is by working directly in collaboration, very close collaboration with partners that uh, really know communities inside and out uh, that facilitate the work. Um, you know, probably our biggest stumbling block, just, just thinking about the previous discussion, is around our own Global North Institution, which has a particular perspective of what it must be like to work in these countries. It, it comes at it from a, a very risk um, um, point of view where it's, it's thinking about how can we manage risks. And in the times of COVID, um, that was particularly challenging because our, our institutions uh, in, in the UK were more about ceasing the work rather than thinking about um, the realities on the ground, which you know the, the pandemic was just another crisis. And we carried on just fine in the projects that we had already launched, working closely with community partners that were already on the front line doing this valuable work and you know, teaching us about um, how, how to conduct research in humanitarian conditions um, and, and being able to then utilize our, our resource and the reach of our network to kind of amplify the results of that research so that it can get back into global policy and back to those international large humanitarian organizations that tend to work more ineffectively by offering very kind of short-term 
top-down solutions that never, never reach people on the ground uh, as, as they need to be reached. And so partnerships are just absolutely the bedrock, as I say, the heart of everything that we're doing as part of Rights for Time. Uh, uh, thank you. You know, all, all these words that are jumping out at, at, at me and I'm sure the rest of the audience, uh, the importance of partnership, which can be translated into collaborations, which is actually the hallmark of, uh, of Catalyst, that the only way to achieve the SDGs is when we talk to each other. And it's not just about uh, developing solutions, programs uh, to solve the problems, but it's about how to do research to evaluate those solutions to make sure uh, that they really work. And if not, how can they be uh, done better, right? So it's always about improvement. It's a continuous iterative process, uh, evolution. I like to say it's evolution that we, we need to keep on assessing ourselves, but doing it in a rigorous fashion. And hence the question, how do you do rigorous research, proper good scientific research under humanitarian conditions so that we can push those solutions further while you know, the balance, making sure that these are local solutions uh, led by the people, designed by the people, and sustainable by the people themselves who are uh, within that kind of predicament, uh, a, a grassroots, let's say, approach. So all these are hallmarks of Catalyst. And I think what's unique about this session is that we're not just talking about programming and solutions, we're putting in the scientific research component, which we tend to forget in our, in our effort to accelerate things. So I think the scientists here are the ones that you know tell us you have to do it right, you have to assess, uh, because that, on the long run, that's how we save time. But the challenges, as uh, Heather mentioned, are those partnerships, right? How do you develop those partnerships? How do you ensure that there's no power dynamics, a global north versus global south? I'm uh, uh, somebody who has you know, an upper hand, uh, decolonizing. Uh, how do you, you ensure that there's no uh, power dynamics bias and things like that? So Catherine, you have written about that and you've experienced different uh, places around the world. And, and I think with your experience, you can t talk to us about how do you develop those partnerships and how do you avoid falling into the pitfalls? Um, not, not sure if I can answer succinctly. I have uh, worked on this in anthropology. We call it relationality. Um, which is a long word to say that we are changing words to, to, to emphasize relationships as opposed to collaboration. And so think hard about your collaboration. Collaboration is a great word, but collaboration can be extremely uneven. Um, and it's like, you know, again, as I said, you do your thing, but let me do mine. Right. And we collaborate because we have the same kind of angle, not quite. Or we could disagree about the processes. For instance, I'll give you an example. You know, is it is it uh, okay to stop an intervention because it's not properly researched and the efficacy of it is not properly looked at? Is that ethical? Or is it ethical to rush through a project that will help those who can help themselves faster than help the marginalized? Is, you know, the ethics of this has to be like looked at, looked at carefully. So I'm saying, you know, we in my field emphasize this relationship building components very, very, um, important it is very important and this comes through time what's not fun is that funders don't fund that bit so they just fund action in the field and then they don't fund networking afterwards and a lot of this relationship building is about networking it's about listening it's about meeting you um, face to face more than one second uh, as I'm in, as I'm involved in the project they grow over time it is a matter of trust if I trust you I'll probably trust your friends <laughs> it's a social network kind of thing that grows especially if it's interdisciplinary so one of the I don't know what your question was whether it was a how how the how question about how you make it work you make it work by thinking of research as a network building exercise as well as a product which is simply does this work or for whom or for when or for where does it work etc so if you had to think of one single word in answer to that it would be that kind of like creative relations or this network building that you're using at the heart of it i mean i often say you know research is the brain of uh, action because it tells you what what you know, uh, ethics is the heart because it tells you what's right, morally right or not. And then everything else, you know, your fingers and how many hands you have, that's your network capacity. And you need to be able to stretch 
um, not always in person, but through others. So you work, uh, you have an equitable, sustainable, strong partnership with one person who then has another one with another person. And that's actually how I met Sue, for instance, and now we're on this panel. So it is kind of like, um, you know, an example of uh, research partnerships. I think that's how, how we can think about it. Um, thank you. Yes. And, and, and as we develop those partnerships, as you uh, described them, uh, I think one thing we also need to take into consideration, it's not just those uh, partnerships in isolation. It's about an ecosystem uh, that fosters those relationships and that ensures their continuity, that ensures that they're always critiquing each other, that ensures that everybody's really listening to the other uh, and, and not just, you know, uh, uh, just thinking of what they know and, and taking the others uh, very lightly and not really listening. So how do we create such an ecosystem, right, to foster those kinds of relationships? Uh, the question is to you, Sue. So could you share with us your perspective on creating these ecosystems from your experience in research and, and, and share some case studies of uh, how you've been able to evaluate that and um, share some insight? Right. Thank you, Rana. And I can't agree with Catherine more on the common goal. Um, I guess um, Catherine's really absolutely spot on when she's um, talking about um, different researchers come in and like to do this and do that. And then they kind of try to uh, think about their own publications. But um, while we are doing, uh, we love reading, we just love it because it is for the um, better understanding of um, a very um, meaningful um, cause. Um, so that kind of common goal is absolutely essential. And um, I actually do two types of research other than using um, social psychology to conduct behavioral and leadership studies. I also do um, um, organizational and sectorial studies using institutional and organizational theories. And it's a coincidence that I actually looked at um, an ecosystem, not exactly a research-based ecosystem, but it's an ecosystem that addresses um, property alleviation. That might actually be able to um, give us some insight because there is an analogy there. So um, Rana, if I could share screen, is that all right? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I gave you, yeah, there you go. Okay, so I think, uh, sorry about that, try to be slick, but it's always <laughs> counterproductive. So this is um, actually a research, um, try to maximize it. So this is a research that I looked at and, um, um, put out the visualization of an ecosystem of actually a funding. And here, this is the input side where all the funding as well as the knowledge from um, universities, from um, impact investors and all that, they provide resources for here. These are the um, intermediary social innovators, social entrepreneurs in um, putting forth interventions for the beneficiaries and eventually the outcome of property alleviation and also um, um, avoidance of um, social exclusion. And so all that is depict um, the um, ecosystem of a funding um, environment. So interestingly, if we put it it's very similar to um, research, we have all the input and funding and all that. We have the researchers and the outcome is definitely um, looking at things like theory of change in social enterprises or social projects. Then um, over time, in terms of the cumulative impact creation that we could actually look at um, whether it's talking about um, um, sustainability projects or talking about human development or even um, we call social return on investment, these could actually be very important for us to advance the SDG. Then um, this is um, a case study that I um, looked at for um, that ecosystem. And in the end, what I want to say, um, it's uh, I concluded with a virtuous cycle of different drivers 
from legitimacy, shared value, knowledge creation, and collective ident identity in supporting this responsible innovation ecosystem. Because the funding um, only fund innovative projects as well as um, on the um, entrepreneurial um, basis for um, alleviating poverty uh, in Hong Kong. So from my point of view, this is also um, could be um, how we operate as researchers is really the legitimacy, um, like what Catherine has talked about ethics, and then we share the same values system. And we definitely create knowledge. And we work together with that um, collective identity in advancing social good and helping the social sector to um, learn about um, the social issues better. So from my point of view, coincidentally, allowed me to have shared um, the diagrams and happened to be a research um, of a case. But um, I think it's also um, very much happening um, for us researchers when we collaborate and enter into partnerships. Uh, thank you, Sue, for sharing that. And as, as the audience can see, we're actually jumping. Uh, there is a thread here, uh, but it's about, uh, you know, thinking broad and, and pulling in everybody who has expertise and experience so that we could better understand how we can do better research under these conditions. Um, and I'm going to highlight a, a point that I'm, I'm going to go around and ask about. But how do we at some point then? translate all this research that we're coming up with and trying to figure out into policy that really makes a difference. Uh, because ultimately, if the research is only in a publication or, uh, or in, in somebody's uh, you know, uh, report, how do we make sure it goes there? I'm going to go to Heather and then to you, Catherine, uh, and back to Sue to answer that question. Um, Heather. Thank you, Rana. I think um, just from a practical perspective that you have to keep knocking at policymakers' doors to keep putting research in front of them I mean, with all of the messaging that we are all constantly being hit with and all the calls for attention. You, you have to make sure that you're consistent with your messaging, that you're persistent with your messaging. And most important, before you get to the messaging aspect, hopefully policymakers have been brought along with you from the design of the project all the way through to when you have results, which again is a matter of persistently following up. It's, it's drawing on networks from partners, um, from, from others uh, that, that you know to be able to put you in touch with the right um, person at the right level to be able to take on board the results of the research, who understand the research most importantly and value the research so that they could feed it into the organization for, for positive effect. And I think probably most importantly is, is to, to work those networks and be persistent. Uh, thank you, that's, that's very true. But again, uh, how do we involve the local people, the local government, the local every, it's, nice, it's good and easy to say that when, when you're a researcher coming from uh, Birmingham or Yale, but how do we translate that locally? So Catherine, you, you wanted to jump okay. in and come. Come in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's not that we don't work at the local level. It's, it's very much, as I said in my previous answer, that's at the heart of everything that we do at the local level. So people at the local level should already know. But I think what's really important to, to catalyze large scale change, to bring about funding, to then promote further research and to bring in programs and initiatives that ac actually work, is that we have to also address from the very top. And a lot of that comes around educating policymakers at the top about the work that you're doing. So they should already be on your advisory board. They should already be coming to research meetings. They should already be introduced to local partners so that they can understand what's happening on the ground, so they could see how important it is, so they could feed it up at the higher international level to be able to instigate really large scale changes in the funding landscape to drive forward future research and impact agendas. Absolutely. Thank you, Heather, for adding to what you previously said. And I think one, one way to get those local people who are not the scientists or the researchers or maybe even the implementers is, is language. Language is always a problem and a challenge and a barrier uh, to make sure that all the research is accessible to those people to get them engaged from the beginning and, and, and to foster that feeling of agency going forward. Catherine, yes. I started to think because I saw an interesting question in the chat by Alouk, who says, when you try to integrate a new partner, what is a must and what is a nice to have features? And I had like, you know, oh, it must be honesty, et cetera. And then now I don't think so. It's not honesty. It's, it's to bring on board somebody where they have a very well-defined role, which is do what you don't do. We do what you're not good at. So bring somebody who's like 
different from you. That's a must have, right? Um, and so for example, as a researcher, now, not so much now, but like five years ago, I was doing my research and I didn't think about impact and I didn't think about policy enough, right? So starting work in humanitarian conditions, I started my, saying myself much more explicitly, okay, so how does my research translate into the so what question, you know? Uh, so what does that mean for this and this and this person? And so I actually needed some partners that were more savvy about policy. I needed some partners who were more savvy about media. I needed some partners who were more savvy about, you know, uh, making what I do have larger effects and maybe me helping other people do have larger effects. So in answer to that question, I would say pick somebody who's different <laughs> from you. But it make in there is a point in that collective identity that Sue talked about, which I'm not quite sure what it means to me, but when she was saying it, I've, I felt sometimes in humanitarian context, because that's a different kind of like situation than others. Sometimes I think of the humanitarian context, like the, the solar system, and that's our collective identity. We're on the solar system. The humanitarians are from, uh, you know, they are from, uh, uh, Venus because they have a, a great heart and they want to like save the world. The researchers are from Mars because we are very rigorous about our methods. The funders are like Jupiter because they have all the power. The media is like Mercury, planet, they move around very swiftly. And the, the people kind of are lost into those solar system populated by these big planets. What you want to do is look around and change that kind of system so that uh, you recognize each actor for having a particular role in that humanitarian solar system kind of thing. And for me, when I think of that image, I think of a very vast space where it's easily to get lost and your message is not being lost. And the reason why it's not lost is because you make partnerships across. So I think of the policymakers as the big guns, the big planets, but I'm going to approach them, you know, swiftly and nimbly and with a message that's clear. The problem I think for the researchers is that they can't crystallize their research in a very small sentence that makes a lot of sense because they don't like simplifying things. In humanitarian context, it's very dangerous to simplify things. Um, it's extremely dangerous to have good intentions without good methods. Um, there's all kinds of sins that you have to avoid. Uh, but on, your, on, the, on, the, on the relationship issue with making a difference in terms of policy, Again, it's that relation building, right? It doesn't happen. Those planets don't collide every Friday. You know, you have to like think about communication um, and, and, and language in a way that comes across and kind of like, so you have to think, I think what I thought Sue was saying, you have to think about that collective identity in mind, but you also have to think about the ecosystem in which you, you're moving through um, and make sure that you have a good map of what's going on, I think in order to communicate to the people that matter, who are not necessarily the big, the big planets, if that makes sense, right? So I, when I move into a humanitarian context, right, I, I think of, of, sometimes I think of mapping the power relationships, the gravity that makes sense. That's why I think about a solar system um, and who talks to who, who has influence on whom and how to navigate all this to get a specific method about people and what their voices say and what they matter to move around the space. Uh, because very often, as you probably implied, Rana, the voices of local people are getting like lost in the system. Thank you. That's a great anal analogy of the planets uh, and highlighting the different stakeholders that need to be engaged uh, across, uh, across the board if we want to really benefit from the research to create uh, better lives and achieve the SDGs. Uh, to you, Sue, would you, what, what are your comments on how do we translate research into policy and uh, what, uh, what is the advice on that? Right, thank you, Rana. And I think I'll combine what Hatha said in terms of multilateral players and also the solar system that Catherine talked about. What I see um, definitely kind of, um, definitely align with what they're talking about, but in terms of collective identity, I want to link it to common goal. When we actually acting for the solar system of um, SDG, we are all only a part of contributing to a common goal that is larger than life size. And we can't do it alone. 
And when we could actually get a consortium of all the different players and also um, researchers in this context here, we're talking about research, we will become actually very passionate about the whole common goal. And this passion and also seeing that um, common good that will create knowledge creation is that identity driving us because we all share that not only good values, ethics, but it's the outcome of a better world. So, but that thing is, I think, um, important for us to um, not only share, but with that passion, we would be able to um, work closely with sectoral players, entrepreneurs, innovators, as well as other sectoral um, um, important influences, whether it's government officials or even the corporates. From my point of view, sorry, um, I know um, Catherine and Heather, they are far more successful as well as Rana researchers. But for me, my heart is very much in the sector. And that's the reason why I position myself all the time um, in, in the sector. Some of the research that I do actually, um, a lot of them pro bono, neither do they translate into academic research, but they are uh, to be presented to the funders, but they're impressed and I continue to follow them so that they got cumulative data results. So I think um, I, for my ethics is just stay in there, stuck there, and then one day something large, larger than my life size will happen, and that's policy change that I'm aiming at. Wow, I love I love how the conversation is going back and forth from being uh, very rigorously doing science to broadening and how can I achieve impact, but we need to achieve a balance because both are important. Uh, one cannot go the other and, and it's about achieving that balance, but as uh, I want to um, look at the chat and just to make sure that we've answered and addressed all the comments in the chat and, and thank you, uh, Catherine and others who've been looking at the chat and actually into integrating the, the comments as you speak, but there's one that I've seen that's a kind of a question to the panelists uh, would like uh, Rofran Abudia says would uh, and nice to see you Rofran here would like to know the panel. Uh, panel's opinion about action-based research. Would it answer the question about uh, probably how do we uh, make sure that we are serving the people? So action-based research, that's a very general thing. Would any anybody like to address that, Catherine, Sue, or Heather? Uh, what, Heather, do you, you had your hand up? I was flicking through the comments and looking across uh, the, the discussions. They've been really interesting, the points have been raised. Thank you very much. I guess I'm really not clear on what action-based research means because it seems like everything that I'm doing is action-based research. So I'm not sure really how to how to delineate it. Is it is, is it kind of incorporating uh, participants, uh, co-creating kind of research design and carrying out research together, or is it about what you're measuring? As a scientist, I think about action-based, is it sort of like observational in vivo kind of methodology, or do you have a sense, Rana, for the person who asked the question? Uh, no, but I think it's good to uh, actually discuss what it means because we, we throw out all these terminology and these, these terms and, uh, and everybody looks at them from a different perspective. And, what, and unless we unpack them, and I think this is a very good example of how it means something to me, it means something different to you and to the person who asked. And unless we have a conversation uh, to yeah. make sure we're all on the same basis, we will always end up uh, in our silos. And I think this is one, yeah. one important example uh, of this yeah. actually. It's actually recruiting practitioners in the field to become researchers themselves that can own the results and build their actions based on it. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I think that's that's really critical and um, currently I work with individuals who are from the NGO sector who are pursuing PhDs and I think that's that's laudable if, if people have the the space or, or try to carve out the space to be able to do that. I find though that often people are really passionate about their advocacy work and it becomes a bit more difficult for them to come off the front line and, and really then become um, those those who have to then gain the expertise and some of the research methods and then get off the front line and again carry out the research is very laborious so sometimes um, it works out better that people are working in their own kind of domains of ex expertise and they all come together i believe it was um, catherine who was who was talking about that earlier i think um, that tends to be the more 
pragmatic way in my experience that things end up working out, that you know, we all trust each other, we have our domains of expertise, and we work together where we can, but sometimes it's just not practicable given the amount of work that is, is happening on the ground, this really vital work that can't be taken away from. Yeah, actually, I couldn't agree more. It's all about teamwork. Uh, and, you know, things are so complicated. One person cannot do everything. It's about teamwork. And, but in order to be successful, we need to listen to each other uh, and, uh, and, and to be, feel safe by creating an ecosystem and environment where I can voice what I think. I can uh, call out what I feel uncomfortable with. And everybody in that team should be able to take that, whether they agree or disagree, that's another issue, but they should agree to support anyone to feel safe enough to uh, say their opinion. Uh, I think that was something that Voltaire said that I, I may not agree with you, but I will surely make sure that you have a space to talk about how you feel uh, and, and how you disagree. And I think that's the only way forward uh, in that sense. And I think and one thing I would add to, uh, to the question is, is that we also, when we look at who we are doing research on or about is to make sure that we're looking at as we are, this is all of us working together. And we've had this conversation with Catherine. It's not about me serving you or it's a mutual uh, give and take. It's about how do we work together? How do we, we are look, we are saving ourselves. We are studying ourselves in a collective kind of humanity. So as we, we have in the last few minutes of our uh, meeting, and of course, we're not going to solve all the problems in one hour, but this has been touching the tip of the iceberg, having these conversations. And most importantly, I, I believe we need to ensure that we have research as a component, as a human, as a person, as a stakeholder in everything we do so that we do it right while achieving that balance by having a, a very well-rounded team. So I'm gonna go around each one of you, uh, uh, my wonderful, amazing panelists to give us a recommendation uh, you're, you're all scientists and you work in the field of, of understanding uh, the impact in a scientific rigorous way of the different solutions and programs and interventions that are being developed, whether by scientists or practitioners or policymakers, trying to make sure that what works for whom and how. What is your advice? If we were, to, each one will give us a take home uh, advice that we can actually go home and actually do. So something practical uh, on ensuring that research is part of impact evaluation uh, while not falling into the pitfalls and the challenges we, so advice and tips. Uh, I'll start with you, Sue, then Catherine, and then Heather. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, partnership, and but also I have to resonate uh, what Catherine said it's to work with weak ties researchers that means people that you don't know and also um, an extra thing is um, partnership plus try new things um, I think I don't think um, enough research in terms of looking at multi-level studies multi uh, multidisciplinary multi-methods um, approaches um, are kind of done sufficiently enough in order to look not only look at interpersonal stuff but least um, um, interpersonal meso organizational or even community and and there's a lack of that so partnership in terms of getting a consortium of different expertise in order to look at a holistic perspective. Thank you, Catherine. Mm. This is hard. Um, I would say work with someone who always checks your assumption, who holds your assumptions in check. And there's nothing worse than, as I say, proceeding with good intentions and having your, your intentions lead your path you want to do good, but you are actually completely mistaken in the way you do good. And a good example of that would be that you're very paternalistic in your approach to community engagement. And we know this, but we do it all the time. And so the advantage to research is, 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 is hiring somebody's brain that's trained to look at things systematically uh, and who has the time to do that. So my training is simply, I look at the evidence, I triage the evidence, I add evidence with my weak tie um, friends and partners, and I kind of check through all angles what is really going on. I think the doer um, suffers from the lack of being able to have the time to do that. Uh, the doer is doing. Uh, I do a heck of a lot, but I am trained to um, weigh the evidence, right? And so that's that's 
what I so the one word the one word is always check your assumptions you know and if you can't do it yourself then please talk to somebody who will challenge those somebody from a discipline somebody who's a policymaker somebody and help other people check their assumptions too well wow, that's amazing I mean these both are amazing and and although it may make us feel uncomfortable but I think the hallmark of success is being uncomfortable and putting ourselves in those situations and embracing it and, and, and learning from it and considering it an opportunity. Heather. Thanks, Rana. I'm a bit of a serial monogamist. I think about partnerships as being very deep, that you really do need to spend some time getting to know your partner, getting to know what their priorities are, figuring out where your worlds collide, thinking carefully about you know, the research design and the data sources and planning you know, with the end in mind, like who, who do you want to reach with your evidence um, and with your, your critique of the, the evidence and then working backwards from there to, and to think about what, you know, how, how you're going to work in partnership to educate the policymakers to be able to weigh up all of the evidence and um, reach the solution or solutions that are going to benefit um, the partner and the, the community that you work with and intersectoral interdisciplinary research it takes a lot of time and it, it takes a lot of time to get to know each other, to do really, you know, cutting edge, high quality, impactful research. It doesn't just happen. I know a lot of people that have a, a little dabble do yet and they work with a lot of different partners and they play the field. But I think it's really hard to do kind of like really deep, meaningful work like that. I think you need to put the time in. Thank you. Again, amazing advice. So uh, um, I'm going to end this panel by, by sharing my own advice from my own experience is, is to listen, 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 listen to each other. Uh, there's a famous story where uh, a, a philosopher, um, a scientist went to a philosopher and he, he said, I'm coming here to learn from you. And he, and the scientist kept talking and talking and talking and the philosopher poured him some tea and he kept pouring the tea and the tea filled up the cup and then the cup started overflowing and the philosopher kept pouring the tea. And then suddenly the scientist said, wow, wait a minute, the cup is overflowing. And he said, that's just like you, you're talking and you're not listening. And if we don't listen, we won't be able to learn. So to, to, to listen, uh, and and uh, trust those in front of us. We may critique them. We may not like what they say, but to to have some trust, uh, and and that can be that whole word of trust can be unpacked. But that's a different session for another time. But if we can go back, taking all those three advice, four advice that we have, that would be fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the, my wonderful panelists for joining us today. Uh, regard, uh, even though it's you're in different time zones, your commitments and, and, and Heather being on a train. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the audience and all the wonderful comments and even the discussion among the, the, the audience. Uh, and I hope you will take these conversations and keep in touch with each other, with us, with the panel, so that we can really do good research so that we can achieve the sustainable development goals uh, uh, to make a better future for, for generations to come. And thank you for uh, Catalyst and We Love Reading team for doing all the magic behind the scenes and making this happen. I urge you, please attend all the rest of the sessions at in Catalyzing Change Week and apply to be a member of Catalyst. We, all, we need you all, we need everybody. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>